Let's say uh, we, we take as the basic supposition, which is the thing that one sees in the experience of Satori or, or awakening or whatever you want to call it, that this now moment in which I'm talking and you're listening is eternity. That although we have somehow conned ourselves into the notion that this moment is rather ordinary and that we may not feel very well and that uh, we're sort of vaguely frustrated and worried and so on and that it ought to be changed. This is it. So you don't need to do anything at all. But the difficulty about explaining that is that don't, you, you mustn't try not to do anything because that's doing something. How do we explain that? Because there's nothing to explain, it's the, it, it, it is the way it is now, you see. And if you understand that, it will automatically wake you up. That's why Zen teachers use shock treatment to uh, sometimes while they hit people or shout at them or cr create a sudden surprise. Because it is that jolt that suddenly brings you here. See, there's no road to here, because you're already there. And if you ask me, how am I going to get here? It'll be like the famous story of the American tourist in England, who asked some yokel the way to Upper Tuddenham, a little village. And the yokel scratched his head and he said, Well, sir, I do know where it is, but if I were you, I wouldn't start from here. <laughs> <laughs> so, you see, when you ask, how do I attain the knowledge of God? How do I attain nirvana, liberation? All I can say is it's the wrong question. Why do you want to attain it? Because the very fact that you're wanting to attain it is the only thing that prevents you from getting there.
You already have it. But of course, uh, it's, it's up to you. It's your privilege to pretend that you don't. That's your game. That's your life game. That's what makes you think you're an ego. And uh, when you want to wake up, you will. Just like that. If you're not awake, it shows you don't want to. You're, you're still playing the hide part of the game. You're still, as it were, the, the, the self, pretending it's not the self. That's what you want to do. So you see, in that way too, you're already there. When you understand this, a funny thing happens. And some people uh, misinterpret it. You will discover, as this happens, that the distinction between voluntary and involuntary behavior disappears. You will realize that what you describe as things under your own will feel exactly the same as things going on outside you. You watch other people moving and you know you're doing that. Just like you're breathing or circulating your blood. If you don't understand what's going on, you're liable to get crazy at this point and to feel that you are God in the Jehovah sense. say that you actually have power over other people so that you could alter what they're doing and that you are omnipotent in a very crude literal kind of Bible sense you see and uh, a lot of people feel that and they go crazy they have to put them away they think they're Jesus Christ and that everybody ought to fall down and worship that's only they got their wires crossed they haven't been able to, this experience happened to them, but they don't know how to interpret it. So be careful of that. Jung calls it inflation. People who get the holy man syndrome. That uh, I've suddenly discovered that I'm the Lord and that I'm above good and evil and so on. And that, that uh, therefore I start giving myself airs and graces. But the point is everybody else is too. discover that you're that, then you ought to know that everybody else is. Well, for example, let, let's see how in, in other ways you might realize this. Most people think when they open their eyes and look around that what they are seeing is outside. It seems, doesn't it, that you are behind your eyes.
and that behind the eyes there is a blank which you can't see at all turn around and you see something else in front of you but behind the eyes there seems to be something that has no color it isn't dark it isn't light it's just uh, it's there from a tactile standpoint you can feel it with your fingers although you don't get inside it but what is that behind your eyes you see well actually when you look out there and see all these people and, and things sitting around that's how it feels inside your head the color of this room is back here in the nervous system where the optical nerves are at the back of the head it's in there it's what you're experiencing what you see out here is a neurological experience now if that hits you and you feel sensuously that that's so you may think that then, then therefore the external world is all inside my skull but you've got to correct that with the thought that your skull is also in the external world So you suddenly begin to feel, well, wow, what a kind of a situation is this? It's inside me, and I'm inside it, and it's inside me, and I'm inside it. But that's the way it is. This is the, what you could call, transaction, rather than interaction, between the individual and the world. Just like, for example, in buying and selling, there cannot be an act of buying unless there's simultaneously an act of selling, and vice versa. So the relationship between the organism and the environment is transactional. The environment grows the organism and in turn the organism creates the environment. The organism turns the sun into light, but it requires there to be an environment containing a sun for there to be an organism at all. And the answer to it is simply they're all one process. that organisms by chance came into this world put it rather that this world is the sort of environment which grows organisms it was that way from the beginning just in the same way for I mean the organisms may in time have arrived in the scene or out of the scene later than the beginning of the scene but from the moment it went bang in the beginning that's the way it started organisms like us us sitting here were involved in it you see look here let's take the, the propagation of an electric current I can have a an electric current running through a wire that goes all the way around the earth
and uh, here we have our power source, and here we have a switch. All right. Here's the positive pole, here's the negative pole. Now, before that switch closes, there is, the current doesn't exactly behave like water in a pipe. There isn't current here waiting to jump the gap as soon as the switch is closed. The current doesn't even start until the switch is closed from the positive pole. It never starts unless the point of arrival is there. Now it'll take an interval for that current to get going and a circuit if it's going all the way around the earth. It's a long run. But the, but the finishing point has to be closed before it will even start from the beginning. In a similar way, although uh, in, in the development of any physical system, there may be billions of years between the creation of the most primitive form of energy and then the arrival of intelligent life. That in billions of years is just the same thing as the trip of the current around the wire. It takes a little time. But it's already implied. It takes time for an acorn to turn into an oak. But the oak is already implied in the acorn. So in any lump of rock floating about in space, there is implicit human intelligence. Sometime, somehow, somewhere. They all go together. So don't differentiate yourself and stand off against this and say, I am a living organism in a world made of a lot of dead junk, rocks and stuff. It all goes together. Those rocks are just as much you as your fingernails. You need rocks. What are you going to stand on? Now, I want to get down to the simplest possible nitty-gritty of what we've been talking about in a very easy way. To ask ourselves the question, quite fundamentally, what's all the trouble about? In other words, what is your state of mind when you contemplate the possibility of everything becoming nothing. All right, so the universe is a transitory system. 
like a bubble, like smoke, like foam on the water. And so, how easy? Just go along with it, dissolve. So, what's the problem? Why, why don't we want to give up? What do we think we're going to get by holding on and by resisting the dissolution? Now, I'm not saying at the moment that uh, as I'm a sort of preacher advocating giving up. What I'm interested in for you to feel is what do, what do you really feel like inside at the prospect of there being nothing, of this whole thing being a bubble that dissolves. You see, about death, the reality of approaching death, people are apt to feel chilly, cold, lonely, scared because it's an unknown. The, the most frightening thing about death is there might be something beyond it. And you don't know what it is. You remember, facing the world as a child or at any time, the world is full of threats, mostly from other people. And there are monsters. There are all sorts of things which scare you, but beyond every monster is death. Dissolution is the end of it all. And by and large, the art of government is to fill that void beyond death with threats of a rather unspecified nature so that we can rule people by saying, if you don't do as I tell you, I'll kill you. Or you'll kill yourself. And so long as we can be scared of that, and so long as we can be made to think of death as a bad thing, we can be ruled. And that is why no government likes mystics. Because if we define the mystic as the person who is no longer scared of death, because the mystic is, in the simplest possible language, the person who understands that you have to have nothing to have something. <laughs> so, you can't fundamentally scare the mystic with death. Because, say, well, what end can it all come to? What's all the trouble about? The most it can come to is nothing.
I mean, there may be some troubles on the way of resisting this, basically resisting it. I mean, as you might say, the very cells in your body resist their dissolution. And so, in this resistance, there's an experience called pain, which we've been discussing. But beyond pain, this is annihilation. So it seems, anyway. What will it be like to go to sleep and never wake up? Nobody can think about it. But what is that state when you're teased out of thought? See, get with it. Going to sleep and never waking up. This is not, as you would fantasize it, a state of being in the dark forever. It is not like being buried alive, because then there's an experience of darkness. Now I remember a little while ago, uh, having at one of my seminars, a girl who was born blind. And I had the most interesting discussion with her, because she doesn't know what darkness is. The word is absolutely meaningless to her. Because she's never seen light. Now so, when you really think about nothingness, it, it becomes like what I've often referred to, is how your head looks to your eyes. And behind the eyes you don't see darkness, do you? Right now. You are not aware of a contrast of light here and black there. Behind the visual field, this way, you can't see darkness. There is simply nothing conceivable at all. Neither darkness nor light. See? All right. So, might one venture to say almost that that area of blankness we call death is what lies behind the eyes. In other words, it is what we can't think about <laughs> that's what's watching. <laughs>
In other words, the farthest we can go in thinking about nothing, you see, we get to the root of the matter. Let me put this in another way. The world is form. Now, you cannot look for the origin of form in form. Because what you would get then would be a, a universe where you couldn't make out any form at all because there was so much of it. It would be like writing a letter on top of a newspaper and then putting a picture over that and then doing something else until there wasn't a single square millimeter of paper left, of blank paper. Nobody could read anything. But one can read, one can see form, one can see the world. Simply because there's always emptiness behind it. So you see, in this way, emptiness being the mother of form. And you can always say, yes, only the form is there, that's all that's real. But that is only saying, it's all that is figure. What about background? It always has to be there. humane people admit that they're rascals. That's, you see, on the side of the not respectable, the selfish. But so also, all humane people should admit that they're jokers, that they're playing games and playing tricks, that I am doing it on you. I am most ready to admit this. I hoaxed you all into coming here to tell you what? <laughs> <laughs> this was a trap, you see, but I'm going to make it an entertaining trap so that uh, you won't feel so badly about it. Uh, now, this is philosophy, but I think philosophy is like music. You go to a concert and you listen to somebody play Bach or Mozart or Beethoven. And what's all that about? about anything except dee 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 you know that's what it's about and so in the same way uh, the, as I conceive my work as a philosopher I'm simply pointing out that existence is the same kind of a thing as a Bach invention it's going this way and that way and hills and waters going t -t 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 all out there and the fish are going around in it and uh, breeding and the ducks are doing this that and the other 
And that's the same thing as dee 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 See? So, uh, if you can uh, admit that, that that's what it's all about, you have a little problem. Because it's not only the threat that it really might be serious and that you shouldn't be laughing about this, <laughs> but there's also a kind of opposite. Then are you saying it's merely just fiddling around? I mean, you're saying, it's only a game? Is that all there is to it? Well, what do you think? This again is a question that everybody has to think things through. What did you want? <laughs> Didn't you want a game? Did you want it to be serious in the end? What, I mean, think about the question. What kind of a, a thing would you like God to be? What would you like to do for eternity? Really? Here is uh, Jan van Eyck who paints the eschatological picture of the Last Judgment. What a strange man he must have been. For here is heaven above and hell below. And in heaven, here's God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost, all there together, and the Virgin Mary, and the Apostles. And they're all sitting in committee. And they have an aisle, you know, just like in church, and there they are facing each other, and they're all sitting there very solemnly. Now, I don't know what it's about, but below, right at the end of the aisle, you see, where all these apostles are sitting, is St. Michael. A rather gorgeous figure in beautiful armor with wings. And underneath him is a bat-winged skull. And beneath those bat wings, though, all horror is let loose. Michael is about to slosh that skull, you see, with his sword. But below, ooh, there are nude bodies, some of them pretty comely. And they're all squirming in there, and they're being eaten by worms. And they're eating the worms, and there's a kind of a mush. It's like the sort of situation you find when you turn up a big rock, and there's all that going on underneath. <laughs> now, there's no question whatever that Van Eyck, the painter, had more fun painting that part of the picture than he did painting the top part. So in the same way with, the, with Hieronymus Bosch and with Bruegel, they painted every kind of weird surrealistic deviltry going on and they really loved it, but they couldn't admit it.
Now the only time when the holy people had a ball was when, for example, the Islamic artists made arabesques and the Celtic artists made um, fantastically intricate lattices to decorate the margins of their gospels and uh, missals. They are unbelievably beautiful or take stained glass or something like that, but what are they doing? What's it all about? So when you ask the question, then what will you do in heaven? And the thing you want to do, of course, is to get mixed up in this, this little, see, like, it's like the musician, he likes to take a melody, and he likes to put another melody that fits in with it, and another one that fits in with both, and then a fourth one, and arrange them together, and he invents an instrument like an organ that he plays with two hands, then he adds foot pedals so that he can play with his two feet. And he can get this hand doing one rhythm, this doing another, this doing another, and this doing another. See, that makes it complicated. And so when drummers get together and play, somebody starts out with a certain rhythm, and then that rhythm has holes in it. In other words, it has certain silences, and the next drummer fills those silences in an interesting way. He counts and picks out a pattern. And what do you imagine DNA is? The basic form of biological existence. Now, DNA is like a necklace, like Charlotte's wearing, with different kinds of beads in it. And according to the order and the way those beads are arranged, so you get genes, and so you get the particular form of life that emerges from those genes. So what we're doing, basic down, way down, is saying, she loves me, she don't. She'll have me, she won't. She would if she could, but she can't. Tinker, Taylor, Solar, Savior, Rich Man, Poor Man, Beggar Man, Thief. Well, this is the way life is going on. And as a result comes all this, you see. Question is then, you see, in your heart of hearts, you can take the attitude that all this is terrible or that it's dreadfully serious. You see, you can play comedies, you can play tragedies, uh, farces, histories and romances and all that kind of thing and you can take these various attitudes to it but if you are awakened and as it were you've been let into the secret which is what we've been talking about see as the web is also the curtain you know, the veil
veil which hides the face of God from the angels, you see. There's always this veil. That's why we like a striptease. Because there's an implication that this, you should never give the show completely away. There always should be a little bit of a veil left, you see. There always is. Because even if you find the striptease artist gets completely naked, there's really something hidden. What's the motivation? What sort of a person is she? Would I really like to embrace her? Or would she have bad breath? You know? Or something. And uh, you, you never really know. You never really get to the bottom. That's why everybody, all men poets, say that women are basically mysterious. And they ought to be. So are men basically mysterious from women's point of view. Although they play that they're not. See, this is the way it goes. Men are supposed to be very open. And they say, well, of a certain situation, this is the way it is. After all, it's perfectly rational. It's just a matter of practical affairs. And women say, well, they say, I'm not quite as articulate as you are, but I know there's something you've left out, but I can't explain it. <laughs> and by this means, everything is kept going. <laughs> Duality is always secretly unity. Take the contrast between the words we use, explicit and implicit. The very valuable words. What is explicit? What's on the outside? Let's say how we come on publicly. Explicitly, we are thus and so. We have a fight. Uh, we're in competition, say, in business, explicitly. But implicitly, we've worked this out that we have agreed in a secret way that nobody knows about that this competition is extremely valuable to both of us. Take it politically, for example. Let's take the situation of Russia versus the United States. Explicitly, in public, this has to be a big fight. These two ways of life, these two ideologies are opposed. They say, you know, we are... Uh, but behind the scenes, it's all been carefully worked out. You bet it has. That this opposition has to happen. Because our economy depends on it. And their economy depends on it. And everybody knows this who's, got, who's smart. But there are a lot of people who get taken in by the propaganda, and they should be taken in because that makes the thing work. <laughs> it's crazy. But that's the way it goes. And everything works this way. There is, uh, for example, when swans start to mate, they're not sure what they're supposed to do. And they, they begin to fight. I had a long talk about this with, with C.G. Jung. He lived uh, on the edge of Lake Zurich, and he had a little summer house right on the water's edge, and there were many swans there.
I was getting up after, at the end of a conversation with him, and we were beginning to walk back to the main house, and I said, isn't it true that swans are monogamous? And he said, yes, uh, they are. He said, you know, I have had most interesting relationships between these swans and many of my female patients who thought they were homosexual. wasn't a uh, sexual snob. I mean, he, he understood all the legitimacy of all kinds of sexual variations. But he said it has been a point of departure for our discussions. And he said it's a very funny thing that when they begin to mate, they start fighting. And they don't know what it's all about, and then suddenly the fight turns into lovemaking. So that's what I mean. Underneath our position, there is love. Underneath duality, there's unity. The Tweedledum and Tweedledee agreed to have a battle. So, you see, here's that weaving principle. The things hold together by over, under, under, over, over, under, under, over, over, under, under, over. And that creates a stuff, it creates a fabric, it creates clothing, it creates shelter, it creates what we call matter. Matter, mater, mother, and also the same word, maya, illusion. <laughs> See, the world as a marvelous illusion. Now, we've got to go into this. Look, look at another form of the thing. You can play it not only by two as one, but you can play it by three as one.
You know the uh, trademark for Valentine's Ale, which is three interlocked rings. Now the way these rings are interlocked is such that they are joined only if the three of them are present. If you take one away, the other two fall apart. This is a very interesting phenomenon, but it can be created physically with uh, steel rings. Their, their cohesion depends on all three of them being present.